Okay, good evening again, again from my side. Uh, first of all, to, to all the people in the room that have seen me the whole day, but also to our online participants, of course, that have been with us and especially to those that now join for the keynote. Tonight, we are very honored to welcome Theda Skoshbaugh, who is currently the Victor S. Thomas Professor for Government and Sociology at the Harvard University. And I also want to mention that she has been the first ever female sociologist to be granted tenure at Harvard. Theda Skoshbaugh is an accomplished researcher that has influenced many scholars over decades. Um, among of them, many are in the room and on the screens tonight. She has been awarded the Skutte Prize for, and I quote here, the most, most remarkable achievements within the field of political science in 2007 for her visionary analysis of the significance of the state for revolutions, welfare and political trust pursued with theoretical depth and empirical evidence. She has also been elected as a member into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, as well as the American Philosophical Society and the National Academy of Sciences. Far from being only, and only is he in quotes, an outstanding academic, Peter Scotchball is also an engaged intellectual. She's the founder and director of SSN, the Scholars Strategy Network. Within this network, Theda Scotchbill is striving to connect researchers and policymakers, aiming to improve policy decisions, promote evidence-based politics, and strengthen democracy. She is an expert among, on, among other things, healthcare reform, public policy, civic engagement, and partisan polarization in, Amer in the American democracy. But one would only be mistaken to assume that her expertise is only limited to the field of political science and sociology. As uh, we learned from our research that we did for this short speech tonight, um, we also learned that she is an avid supporter of the New York England Patriots and she's deeply knowledgeable in all things American football. In recent years, Theda Scotchpole has concentrated on researching the change in the makeup, ideological convictions, and the outlook of the Republican Party, and the impact of the Trump presidency on American political life. Evidently, we could not have found a scholar that is more suited to close the first day of our workshop with her keynote titled, Saving America Once Again, Comparing the Anti-Trump Resistance to the Tea Party. Please give Professor Scotchpole a warm welcome. And Professor Scoshful, the uh, room will be yours, or so the floor will be used in a minute. I just want to say for all the participants on site and online that there is ample room for discussion after the keynote, so please think of questions. And for the people that are online, we would kindly ask you to use the Q&A function that the Zoom webinars um, provide. And now enjoy. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, and I'm, I'm honored to be here um, virtually in Berlin and uh, with a worldwide audience. One of the advantages of the last year among the many disadvantages is that one can speak with people everywhere um, in, in, much more readily than we could or did before. So what I'm gonna to do today is to talk about research that my colleagues uh, and I have been doing for some years uh, that gets at the question of polarization and the grassroots citizen input to polarization in American politics and to rightward leaning polarization that has radicalized our Republican party, one of two major parties in the United States. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to talk about both the methods of the research that we have done and the kinds of data we've collected and some of the conclusions. I should say that in some ways, this is a, a, a presentation about research on protest, but um, I am a scholar who approaches things by looking at organized groups that have an ongoing presence. And so what I'm gonna be talking about for the Tea Party upsurge of citizen protest and organizing in 2009 to 2011 or 12 
and the subsequent upsurge on the center left uh, through the anti-Trump resistance that kicked in starting right after Donald Trump was elected in 2016, I'm going to be talking about the ongoing organizational presence and, and composition of these movements, not simply about street protests um, that happen on particular occasions. So uh, let me start with a couple of quotes from people that my colleagues and I met in our field research and interviews. Uh, one of them comes from 2009 when um, we interviewed, or my, my colleague Vanessa Williamson uh, interviewed um, a husband and wife in Arizona who had organized a tea party. As they put it, we always voted, but being busy people, we just didn't keep as involved as maybe we should have. Now we're to the point where we're really worried about our country. I feel like we've come out of retirement. We do Tea Party stuff to take the country back to where we think it should be. And that phrase about taking the country back to where we think it should be, we heard from Tea Party activists all over the country uh, when we did our, our original research back in that period. And we still hear it from those who are still organizing and, um, and uh, expressing their views. Now, eight years later, or almost eight years later, um, I was in the field in Wisconsin interviewing one of many uh, activists who organized local anti-Trump resistance groups all over the country. And here's what one of them said to me. I've always been a voter and donated to my party and some select candidates, but I had not been super involved. Then the presidential campaign in 2016 became more and more ridiculous and frightening and our very worst nightmare happened. My life changed overnight. I was called to action. I feel like a soldier in a war trying to save this country, my children's future, the climate, and the list keeps growing. So uh, that uh, th this pair of quotes gives us a pretty good feeling of the degree to which um, active organizing citizens on the left and the right in the United States feel that the very future of the United States is at stake in the ongoing struggles uh, of this time. So part of our research, uh, because of the, of the work done both on the Tea Party back then and the resistance more recently, um, lays the basis for a, the kind of systematic comparison I'm gonna to offer today. I'm gonna to talk about the emergence and scope of local tea parties and local grassroots resistance groups uh, as we've documented them, uh, who leads and participates in those groups. So that would not be everybody who supports them or sympathizes, but the most active people. Their motives for involvement, why it is that battles over healthcare reform have been right at the center of the fights between left and right. And um, then I'll conclude by talking about uh, these vast organizational fields that we call the Tea Party and the resistance and how they are composed of organizations that operate nationally from the top down and grassroots groups that are more volunteer comp composed operating from the bottom up, but interact with one each other in complicated ways and together have an impact on the two major political parties, on the Republican Party on the right and the Democratic Party on the left. So um, as I stressed before, um, my colleagues and I approach things with an organizational lens. Uh, and not only that, we try to be comprehensive. A lot of analysts have focused on national organizations. Uh, when they talked about the Tea Party back then, they would talk about uh, Coke Network aligned organizations or Tea Party Patriots and Umbrella Group. Uh, and when they talked about the resistance in 2016 and after, they talked about national groups like Indivisible and Swing Left, and more recently Move On, Black Lives Matter, Immigrant Rights, and Pro-Choice groups. What my colleagues and I have added to this picture, we use the research of those who study national groups and study them ourselves, but we've focused on local groups, and we've asked how widespread has been the anti-Trump resistance organizing uh, uh, as well as Tea Party organizing, both within and beyond big cities uh, and places that align with the partisanship of the activists. Um, we have done, um, back when we looked at the, at the Tea Party, we looked at, uh, um, we interviewed activists and observed groups in um, Arizona, New England, 
in Virginia. And we collected data on what we now believe was about 2,000 individually named, voluntarily created local tea parties that existed uh, around the 2009 to 2011 period. For the research on the resistance after 2016, we did field observations and interviews about the activities of 10 grassroots groups that formed in eight pro-Trump counties, two apiece in North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. And we also um, collected individual participant online questionnaire responses from many places around the country, but especially from all of the counties of the vast state of Pennsylvania, which has the advantage of including everything in American politics from the most liberal metropolises to declining industrial areas to very rural and very conservative places. It's also a swing state in American politics. So we've got all of this kind of evidence that we've collected from interviews, from online questionnaires, from field visits and field interviews. And we're able uh, using that to make quite a few comparisons, both quantitative and uh, comparisons of groups, numbers of groups and location, and more qualitative comparisons about the meaning activists attached to their activity and how groups function. Um, we don't have perfectly parallel data from the two periods, but as much parallel data as anybody's ever gonna get. So let me just remind us of the story here. Back in 2009, uh, shortly after Barack Obama took office, backed by a democratic co controlled Congress, uh, both houses. Um, nationwide Tea Party protests uh, started when a commentator, Rick Santelli, appeared on uh, CNBC and called for Tea Party protests against um, the Obama administration's mortgage assistance uh, policies. Within weeks, there were older white Americans dressed in colonial costumes carrying signs denouncing Obama as a communist or a socialist appearing at rallies. And on uh, April 15th, 2009 tax day, there were huge numbers of rallies across the United States, including Washington DC, of course, but the interesting thing is that they were everywhere. Uh, later estimated to be between half a million and close to a million protesters appearing nationwide in 552, 42 counties, as you can see all over the place. Uh, later, uh, our researchers in 2011 document, documented an online presence of more than 900 locally active tea parties in the United States with the white dots showing big ones. And we have since worked to complete more data searches and believe that at one time or another after 2009, there were probably close to 2,000 tea parties um, across the United States, local volunteer led and formed tea party groups. Well, if we come uh, eight years later, we see that in the aftermath of Donald Trump's shocking victory, or was a shocking victory to people in November of 2016, um, Protests started organizing uh, within days, and uh, one big manifestation of it was a huge women's march in Washington, D.C. on January 21st, 2017. But once again, the protests were widespread across the United States on that key day, just like they had been on tax day in 2009. This time, even more people, it was, it's been estimated by the crowd uh, uh, counting consortium led by Jeremy Pressman and Erica Chenoweth. Uh, they, they estimate more than 4 million joined women's marches in more than 600 U.S. cities. Um, and we also know that local groups with an ongoing presence once again were formed at the grassroots of American politics. Uh, partly we know that because within um, a short period after Donald Trump's election in 2016, two former congressional staffers, Ezra Levin and Leah Greenberg, um, teamed up with others in Washington, D.C. To, to publish a guide that was meant to encourage discouraged American liberals, and believe me, they were discouraged, 
uh, to organize locally in order to pressure Congress, uh, which at that point was under Republican control to back uh, the initiatives of an incoming um, radical Republican president, Donald Trump. Um, they also created an interactive map, an internet map that people could sign up their local group on or their local project on. And by March of 2017, it was organizing as a nonprofit, a staffed nonprofit, like almost all other liberal organizations in the United States. But that map also showed that some 6,000 entities of various kinds, and I use the word entity uh, advisedly because they weren't all groups, it turns out, had spread across all US congressional districts. Um, later, um, this mapping was done by uh, Bob Putnam's grandson, Gabriel Perez Putnam, and it shows uh, uh, the darker areas as in the Tea Party map show where there was a higher density of listings on the indivisible map in early, um, I believe early two, 2019. But the fact of the matter is that most of these listings appeared during <coughs> the year of 2017. We have downloads at various time periods and um, the map wasn't really kept up to date very well. And so most of what was listed early remained listed later, even if the groups didn't always survive. One of our research projects has been to understand how persistent groups are and how many of the listings on the indivisible map were actual groups that met face-to-face -face and or used Facebook, as opposed to simply say an individual signing up to attract support for a project they were doing. Um, we think that about 2,000 actual groups uh, exist uh, out of these 4,600 listings. And at one time or another, we think there may have been as many as 3,000 local resistance groups. Now, one of the big questions our REACH search project had at the beginning was whether, now American politics is not only ideologically and partisan polarized now between Republican and Democratic sympathizers. The geography of the two coalitions is very different. If you look at a map of the United States by area, Republicans dominate most states and most counties across the United States because their base of support is in exurban areas, outer ring suburbs, uh, rural small town areas. That's where their core base of support is. And that's become even more true in, in the Donald Trump era. Democrats, on the other hand, tend to be, and liberals, tend to be concentrated in big cities, inner ring suburbs, and of course the occasional college or university town, which may be out in the boonies somewhere, little dot in a sea of red. So, we wondered immediately when we started studying the anti-Trump resistance, whether the local citizen organizing would be widespread the way Tea Party organizing was. Tea Party organizing uh, tended to be in big cities because everybody has some presence in big cities. And then it was all over the map in all the counties and all the states. Well, it turns out that so was the anti-Trump resistance organizing, even though in many places, if you look at up to the upper left there at the state of Pennsylvania. Many of those counties are very, very conservative counties that are in red, in purple, or in, in blue. And yet those areas had either resistance groups only or both Tea Parties and resistance groups. In North Carolina, the organizing was similarly widespread, with the exception that the areas of North Carolina that are dominated by African-American populations including rural African-Americans, those are the areas in white that tend not to have had either Tea Parties or uh, resistance groups. And that's because Tea Parties and resistance groups are organized by middle-class white Americans overwhelmingly. But among areas of states that have a lot of middle-class whites, regardless of whether they lean left or lean right, um, the overwhelming tendency we've found in our research, and this is our first key and interesting finding, is that both sets of groups were organized everywhere. Now, they don't necessarily talk to one another and they don't necessarily know about one another's existence, 
In fact, I know of only one county, I believe it is if I'm remembering correctly, Blair County in the middle of Pennsylvania, I think that's it. And my, don't hold me to that, but it's one of those counties there in the middle has a Tea Party and a resistance group that have co-sponsored community events. But that's it. I've never heard of any other instance of that. Uh, we have very detailed data for the state of Pennsylvania, and you can see that resistance organizations and activities um, were uh, present in all of the counties that voted for Hillary Clinton, not surprising. But they were also uh, much more likely to be widespread than even women's marches were. The map listings from the indivisible map were in 100% of the Clinton counties and 64% of the Trump counties, much more uh, even across the two types of counties than uh, any other uh, manifestation of uh, anti-Trump protesting. So let me talk a little bit about how the grassroots resistance groups formed, and then I'll talk about how they compared to Tea Parties. We found in our research that it was usually people who did not necessarily know one another, even if they lived in the same geographic area. Uh, two to five leader initiators, usually women, launched resistance groups. Often they um, met online uh, after the uh, website Pantsuit Nation, which was set up to celebrate Hillary Clinton's victory turned to local contacting for the purposes of organizing morning sessions after she lost. Many people met that way and discovered that they lived in the same area and teamed up to form uh, resistance groups. Others uh, met as they traveled by bus to and from the 2017 uh, women's marches or by car or by train. Uh, but they didn't necessarily uh, form friendship groups. Sometimes pairs of friends were involved, but a lot of times it was people teaming up who had not worked together before. They usually created a founding meeting that was mobbed by dozens of people, even in small places, somewhere between late November of 2016 and February of 2017, often meeting in the uh, back room of a local restaurant or in the basement of a library, sometimes in the basement of a church. Uh, most of the groups that we uh, found in the field and heard about and and learned about in later questionnaires, did report taking inspiration and tactical advice from a national source, from the Indivisible Guide, maybe from Move On, but they um, often had gotten started even before they heard about these sources, and they usually picked and choose what they took from them. They didn't simply follow orders from above. And uh, by the spring of 2017, most groups were up and running with leaders, plans, projects, Facebook pages, and periodic newsletters. This is what, um, in the pro-Trump counties we visited in these places, this is what some of the founding meetings uh, looked like. Um, including the one there in Lincoln County in Ohio, which is in the basement of a liberal church. And they issued a, a um, credo, a citizen's credo that in many ways modeled on the credo, the Christian credo that their church uh, gave. Um, through both our questionnaires and our observations on national surveys, we discovered that two thirds to 90% of resistance group organizers are women. Overwhelmingly white women, with college degrees, including advanced degrees. Uh, there are male uh, resistors, including male leaders in many places, but they tend to be the partners, husbands, or close friends of the women who are the prime movers. Um, the occupations of resistance leaders and participants tended to be uh, retired or active teachers, professors, healthcare providers, service managers, and some business women, as well as nonprofit managers. Um, not surprisingly, most resistors said that they were Democrats or leaned that way, but others said they were independents or disgruntled Republicans. 
And if we compare the resistance organizers after 2016 to the Tea Party organizers back in 2009, uh, we find that once again, we're dealing with middle-class whites tending to be older, um, including both older adults and retirees. But the Tea Party organizers uh, and participants were somewhat more uh, male, about half and half, male and female. The further you got away from actively leading groups, the more the male component was predominant. Often women were the ones who were actually doing things, not surprising. Uh, Tea Party people uh, worked in small business, construction, military occupations. Um, and, but they were not, and this is, surprises some people, we did not find these activists, the leaders and the core participants of Tea Parties to be non-educated people. They are mostly college educated people, not as many advanced degrees, but uh, this is a split very much between organized sectors of the white middle class in the United States, um, built around different conceptions of what America means. Back to the resistance group leaders, we asked people, you know, why they became active not just leaders, but participants in groups. And uh, we got 436 respondents to our online questionnaire who gave us 765 reasons, up to four per person. And you can see that opposition to Trump is a, a very important reason, but so is saving or improving the country and American democracy. Um, and there are a variety of other reasons. Electing Democrats and progressives is on the list, but it is not the dominant reason people um, got off the couch and started doing more uh, after Trump was elected. And you can take a look later, if you like, at the detailed reasons people gave. We let them say it in their own words, and their words are often quite vivid um, as to what, what the threat that they felt. And, you know, I have to say that that these words are, were mirrored on the right. Um, in the interviews we did back in 2011, we heard from people who felt the United States was under siege, um, that it was necessary to fight to take the country back from um, a president that they dreaded and feared and his supporters. Uh, both of these movements uh, were sparked by an election which in the long stretch of American history is a rare event where a president of one party is elected at the same time as both houses of Congress are put under the leadership of that same party. And particularly if that president is unusual in some way or promises change of direction, that's a rare event. And yet that rare event happened in 2008 and again in 2016. And it is clear that that event is what sparked the simultaneous upsurge of protest and organizing on the left and the right. And in both cases, we heard in our interviews and observed in our reading and, and attending of meetings, a great deal of fear and loathing. Those are the correct words for the newly elected presidents and the co-partisans in Congress. And for Tea Partiers, Barack Obama symbolized un-Americanness because of his race, his immigrant father, which in some ways was even more important in what people said to us in interviews, the fact that he came from Chicago, the fact that he was a professor. That's not a good category in Tea Party land, being a professor. And all of that, his Democratic Party affiliation. Um, people would say things to us like, well, there's something about him that just doesn't add up. And, you know, um, people are not going to, who sit down for an interview with a professor from an Ivy League college, are not going to openly express racial anger or fear, but they went right up to the line and particularly expressed anger and fear about uh, the immigrant uh, background and about the Muslim father. On the other hand, when we talked to resistors eight years later, uh, Donald Trump was just as loathsome in their eyes. He is seen as lacking character and qualifications to be president of the United States, um, standing for selfishness rather than the public interest, 
uh, disrespecting and, and uh, women, minorities, and immigrants. And uh, so he too uh, causes a sense of uh, visceral fear about the future of the country. Now, the interesting thing is that local Tea Party groups and resistance groups did a lot of very similar things. I probably am the only person in the United States who has attended a Tea Party meeting and a resistance meeting in the same couple day period. Because in the current research or the research I was doing before the pandemic where I visited eight pro-Trump counties, I did find that two, two Tea Parties were still meeting in those areas. So I've had the chance to see, um, you know, the choreography of local Tea Party meetings and resistance meetings. And they're similar in many ways. I mean, they're both volunteer creations. They do tend to meet in uh, restaurants or churches or libraries. Um, the Tea Parties are more likely to be in churches, but um, and the churches they would meet in would be quite different kinds of churches. Um, they, Tea Party meetings always start with a Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, and the flag is always at the front of the room. And sometimes they have a prayer, and that prayer often refers to Jesus. But there are Jewish Tea Partiers. They are usually Russian immigrant Jews, and some of them take offense at a prayer that mentions Jesus. So there's not always a prayer uh, in a Tea Party meeting. Resistance groups... Um, like Tea Party people have a period of just informal socializing before they get down to business, but they don't start with the Pledge of Allegiance. They don't start with a prayer, um, even if they're meeting in a church. They're much more likely to start like an academic meeting. They come up and have reports from the officers, maybe from subcommittees and, and task forces. Both groups sometimes have outside speakers. In my observation, local tea parties were more likely to rely on outside speakers uh, than resistance groups. But resistance groups, on the other hand, are much more eager to form ties and maybe co-sponsor meetings with other organizations that represent something beyond their white female constituencies, such as unions, NAACP uh, groups, uh, even the Democratic Party. Now, it's just important to realize that in the opening year of these two movements, 2009, 2017, fights over the Affordable Care Act of 2010, Obamacare were front and center. Um, the um, law hadn't yet passed when the Tea Party was gathering steam and they fought for an entire year to prevent it from being passed. Um, the resistance groups, highly prioritized during their first year, preventing the Republican Congress and the Trump administration from repealing the Affordable Care Act. Um, and, you know, resistance groups could be pretty creative about it. Uh, you know, there were the usual demonstrations where people stood around in the center of town, like in Hazleton, Pennsylvania, holding signs. But in Wilmington, North Carolina, they had Valentine's Day demonstrations and asked their senators to have a heart and not resist, not repeal Obamacare. Um, many groups visited uh, representatives' office weekly. And in these smaller counties I visited, these representatives were Republicans. And so the resistors would appear like this group in Stark County, Ohio, outside the office once a week, usually bringing some cupcakes to the staff. They tried to be polite to the staff, uh, but there they were. And in Catawba County, North Carolina, there were pro-life people in, in the resistance who used the argument that healthcare is pro-life um, uh, to lobby their uh, right-wing Republican uh, congressman. We know that uh, both movements had an impact on overall public opinion in all likelihood because uh, the negative opinions of the Affordable Care Act grew after it was enacted in 2010 while the Tea Party was active and again later uh, when there was another round of Tea Party organizing around the 2014 elections. And after um, the anti-Trump resistance emerged in 2017, public opinion finally switched favorable 
to the Affordable Care Act for the first time, probably because a lot of these local groups actually explained in local newspapers and the local events what was in the law and what people might lose if it was repealed. And that was probably not widely known before that time. Now, let me talk a little bit about an issue that's very important in the bird's eye side of our research. I mean, um, this research gets down to the nitty gritty in the sense that we want to know what local groups are doing, talk to people, observe local groups. Um, but at the same time, we're interested in the big picture. And so I'm going to switch to that because step one in understanding the big picture is to analyze both the Tea Party and the resistance as vast fields of organizations. Now, I think social movement scholars often pay lip service to the idea that a social movement is a concatenation of many different organizations pushing in the same direction, rather than one big organization doing things under central leadership. But it's one thing to pay lip service to that idea. It's another thing to actually document those organizations and how they interact. And that's what we've been trying to do in this research. We've been trying to get a sense of the thousands of local groups that form the ongoing grassroots citizen participation on a volunteer basis, and then try to map the major national organizations of funders, professional advocates, umbrella groups that claim to speak for the entire movements and to some degree channel directions and resources to them. What we have found in the case of both of the Tea Party uh, agglomeration and the resistance agglomeration is that the relationships between top down and bottom up are loose and often full of tensions. Uh, local groups have a lot of autonomy in both cases. Tea parties were remarkably obstinate about deciding things themselves. They often didn't even cooperate with other tea parties in their same state. Only a couple of states actually formed state-level organizations to coordinate tea party activities. And they often didn't even do the same thing when they tried to um, endorse candidates for office. The same to some degree has been true for local resistance groups. They too, because they rely on volunteer enthusiasm, often want to set their own um, agendas. And in both cases, there are national groups out there saying, we speak for the Tea Party, we speak for the resistance, and trying to send you know, policy uh, uh, proposals, uh, call for groups to contact Congress, um, maybe send some small grants of money to help them in the case of the Tea Party set up um, an online presence. In the case of uh, the resistance indivisible makes some grants sometimes for local events. Uh, but um, what we found is that local Tea Parties and local resistance groups have a tendency to pick and choose and to take uh, resources from different sources nationally. And uh, and they don't really take direction very easily, um, even from groups that say they're speaking for them. We found in our research in 2011 that many local Tea Party leaders had not even heard of the groups that were on TV claiming to speak for the entire Tea Party. Others had taken small grants or a bus ride to a, a demonstration from them, but uh, didn't necessarily agree with all of their stands. And definitely found that local resistance groups often, you know, they listen to what the local le leaders like Move On or Indivisible say, but then they do what they want. So uh, we've mapped tensions between the priorities of the top-down and bottom-up groups for both movements. In the case of the Tea Party, Freedom Works, which is, is and was and still is, an ultra free market professional advocacy group with offices in Washington, D.C., uh, did its best to claim to speak for the Tea Party and to train Tea Party activists and uh, try to get them all on the same page uh, for demonstrations and, and uh, electoral pushes. And Tea Party Patriots emerged as a kind of an umbrella group like Indivisible that set up a website and tried to 
offer coordination for local Tea Parties. But we found that the top down groups in the Tea Party were mainly talking about longstanding Coke network type ideas, like entitlement reform, by which they mean cutting Social Security and Medicare for the elderly, or um, cutting down on federal spending in general. But local Tea Parties, local Tea Partiers mainly benefit from Social Security and Medicare. They're older people. They think Medicare and Social Security go to real Americans. They care and much more about crackdowns on immigrants, crime, and welfare spending, by which they mean public spending on low-income people, young people, and um, people of color. If you come forward to the national resistance uh, field of organizations, we found that uh, there's a generational split there. Uh, national resistance organizations tend to be staffed by 20 or 30 somethings who are very interested in left-wing identity causes. They um, tend to prioritize immigrant rights, things like defunding the police um, and um, running a, a progressive um, nomination challenges to Democrats that they think are too compromised for him. Um, the Tea Party, of course, challenged Republicans that they thought were too compromised for him. But at the grassroots, the local groups led in the resistance by older white women who could be and sometimes are the mothers or grandmothers of the young people who are trying to tell them what to do, often take their advice with a whole big grain of salt. And they are not necessarily going to go along with those priorities and especially are less likely to push for non-compromise or for primary challenges from the left when they live in states and communities where they think only a more moderate Democrat could win. So there's an overlap of priorities on both sides in that they have in it the same enemies, but they may have different policy priorities and different tactical priorities. Now, when it comes to the two major political parties, I think you could say that we've concluded that both the Tea Party as a whole and the grass and the resistance as a whole, including the grassroots resistance, did have an impact on the ongoing polarization between the two political parties that, that led to an election in 2020 that had the highest turnout in more than 100 years of American voters even during a pandemic. Uh, you can see that in if, candidates running for the House of Representatives, and this would be true also for state and local offices, there was an upsurge around the time of the Tea Party on the right and an even bigger upsurge uh, on the left. Mainly female and candidates and candidates of color, but lots of candidates overall on the left after the resistance. So, both of these movements, especially their grassroots component, generated a lot more people willing to run for office and a lot more people willing to work for those who ran for office. And we know that in 2010, the first election after Obama was elected president, the Republicans scored major triumphs in state legislatures and in the Congress. And the same thing happened again in 2018, the first election after Trump was elected to office. Democrats scored major triumphs, especially in the House of Representatives. Um, in fact, resistance groups prioritize voting and running for office um, as much as the national groups did starting in 2018. The difference that we find is that local groups were often unwilling to go along with the idea of challenging Republic Democratic incumbents and place more priority on the general election, electing a Democrat of any kind. We um, surveyed all of the counties of Pennsylvania. There are 67 of them. Uh, we found 82 grassroots resistance groups in 49 of those counties. And the most common activity that they engaged in uh, in a survey that we collected in early 2019 about their work in 2018 was knocking on doors. So that means that for weekend after weekend, for months leading into this November 
2018 elections, these older white women went out and knocked on the doors of a full range of their neighbors all over Pennsylvania. So let me conclude by saying that the final question we're asking, what is the overall impact on the parties and their governing agenda. And this research is ongoing. We're still working on it. We're still trying to understand how Tea Party influences have played out in the Republican Party since 2009 to 10, and how resistance efforts are playing out in the Democratic Party. Um, the sheer activism of local groups is not as great after a few years in either case, but there are groups that persist on both sides. What we have found is that resistors since 2016 have taken over all or part of local democratic parties in many areas and revitalized them because local democratic parties were often an empty shell in many states and localities. They have joined with other party constituencies such as blacks, unionists and others. Uh, and they have sort of added white college degreed women into the mix of the Democratic constituency, at least for 2018 and again for 2020. But their impact has not simply been to push the party to the left overall. In some cases, they have pushed it to the left, but in other cases, they simply energized it and they tend to work for the full array of Democratic general election candidates. On the other hand, popular Tea Party people starting in 2010 and continuing to the degree that they remain active and organized, have had a much more radicalizing impact on the Republican Party. They pushed the Congressional Republican Party and then the party as a whole toward ethno-nationalism, toward anger about the changing social and racial composition of American society because the Republican Party was radicalized before the Tea Party, but its radicalism took the form of pushing against any government role in the economy. It was Coke network, top-down radicalization. The bottom-up radicalization of the popular Tea Party has been to create overwhelming pressures for Republican candidates and elected office holders to try to exclude immigrants, and uh, take a much more militant stance toward the voting and citizen participation of young people and people of color. Uh, and these are the people, the Tea Party people who formed the original core of Donald Trump's support. I remember doing an interview in Virginia in the spring of 2011 when Donald Trump first came out with his birther conspiracy ideas about uh, Barack Obama. That was in the lead into the 2012 presidential election and the Tea Party people I interviewed were fascinated by Donald Trump's, as they put it, telling it like it is. And they would have gladly voted for him in the Republican primaries if he had run for president that year. That's why when Donald Trump did declare for presidency years later in 2015, and I was asked by reporters across the United States, do you think he can possibly win? I was not prepared to say he wouldn't because I remembered how much he captured the imagination of grassroots Tea Party people. We know that uh, the pressure uh, in the Tea Party has come from right-leaning districts in the Republican Party. This chart, shows you where Tea Parties were located uh, in the 2010 election and resistance groups in the 2018 election. And you can see that both movements have a big presence in flipped seats, seats that went from Democrat to Republican in 2010 or from uh, the other direction in 2018. But there's a greater concentration of Tea Parties in very conservative Republican districts. That's been true ever since the beginning whereas Democratic uh, resistance groups tend to be more evenly spread. Uh, the Republican Party has radicalized from above and below over the last decade. It originally radicalized from above as the Koch network and other ultra free market billionaires created new incentives for Republican office holders to pursue their agendas. And then in 2015 and 2016, 
we saw Donald Trump come forward with an ethno-nationalist set of appeals. He started by attacking immigrants. And he took advantage of a whole series of major forces that have been playing out in American politics over the last decade. We know that rapid immigration occurred between 1965 until about 2008. And it sparked fears among non-big city uh, living native whites. Uh, that's been true, by the way, throughout American history. Every time the United States goes through a period of rapid immigration from a new part of the world, starting in the 19th century with the arrival of the Irish and later the arrival of, of Germans and Eastern Europeans. Uh, and then um, since 1965, the arrival of people from um, Asia, Latin America, and Africa. After each of these waves of newcomers to the United States, there's been a reaction, a nativist reaction. Uh, we also have in this era, Fox and right-wing media that capture almost in the entirety of the attention of Tea Party people and Trump supporters uh, and uh, deliberately stoke their racial fears uh, in a steady diet every hour, every day. We have white evangelical Protestants who have embraced increasingly nationalist style ideas. Really quiet proto-fascist ideas in some congregations. And they are at the enthusiastic core of Trump's support. And all of these groups, because they're spread out evenly across the US geography, have advantages in the US Electoral College and in the Senate of the United States. Um, so um, in some ways, the Tea Party injected a new organized and passionate form of ethno-nationalism into the process of radicalizing the Republican Party. And Donald Trump brought that to fruition. I'll quickly just say that already by 2015, uh, Republicans were expressing disgruntlement with their own party leadership. Uh, that enabled Donald Trump to run much better among people who are racially resentment, resentful in the Republican Party than Romney and McCain had done. And it opened the door for him to uh, win the primaries at the expense of many standard GOP politicians, and then eke out a victory in the US Electoral College. And once he took control of the presidency, he was able to create a fusion of the two strands of radicalism from above and below that had transformed the Republican Party over the previous decade. On the one hand, he appointed Cope Network style free market people to key posts in the Treasury, the Environmental Protection Agency, anything that had to do with the economy or of opposition to unions. And then he appointed ethno-nationalists to, to, to take charge of immigration policy and law enforcement in the United States. Um, most Republican politicians long in office were horrified at first by particularly the ethno-nationalist extremism of, of Donald Trump, but they have come to accommodate to it because they like the tax cuts he put through and the very conservative judges that he has crowded into the federal judiciary and the Supreme Court. And then we saw that when Trump lost re-election and tried to deny President Biden's victory uh, and urged supporters to disrupt the certification of that victory, a majority, a substantial majority of, of elected officials in the House of Representatives and many in the Senate went along with that. And since then, the situation has become even more dire we now have 60% of Republican identified uh, voters in the United States claiming that Biden is not a legitimately elected president. And we have uh, the full range of, of Republican leaning elites with only a smart smattering of exceptions, endorsing the idea that the insurrection uh, attempted uh, in January and the attempt to steal the election by manipulating um, um, U.S. electoral rules was legitimate. The basis is definitely being laid in the United States for a passionately popularly supported effort. 
to deny any electoral victories to a multiracial and more youthful and more metropolitan democratic coalition in the future. So I'll just end by saying that um, these two upsurges of citizen participation are certainly not the entirety of what has gone into this clash of visions about the meaning of America itself. Is America a beleaguered country over being overtaken by uh, racially and uh, culturally different immigrants? Or is it a, a vibrant, welcoming, inclusive uh, democracy? That's the fight. It's a visceral fight. And it's an uneven fight because the turn toward extremism on one side is much more advanced and much more unlimited than on the other side. And uh, we don't know how far this is gonna go, but we do know that ethno-national Trumpists, surviving Tea Partiers, where they're still with us, but now bolstered by larger numbers of younger men in particular who are supporting Trump, they are, taking over the state and local apparatus for conducting elections and counting the votes. We don't know, to this very day, we do not know how the Democratic Party will manage its sharp internal tensions between young metropolitan constituencies and older suburbanites. Uh, we don't know whether the usual pattern of Democrats losing badly in a midterm election will happen in 2022. We don't know whether elections will be honestly conducted in 2022 and 2024. It's also possible that Trumpist extremism will turn off enough, uh, about a third of Republican voters so that they will either stay home or vote for Democrats in upcoming elections. But I think it's fair to say that the two upsurges of citizen participation in the Tea Party and the resistance that we've been able to map have uh, put the United States in a pivotal moment in which it could go either way um, in the coming years. Stop and take your questions. Sorry for going on so long. And I'm happy to take questions either about the substance or about the research methods, because I know you're interested in both, probably. Thank you so much, Professor Stoshpur. Before we open the q and I just want to say we are about 60 people online and 25 in, in the on-site audience. I think that might be also interesting for you to hear. Um, and we already have one online, one on-site question. I will take more questions. Um, and also for the on-site people, maybe just briefly say your name because Professor Skoshpo wasn't with, on, with us the whole day. So it might be also interesting for her to hear who, who she's talking to. And yes. For the people in the second row, you, you have to stand up and get to the closest microphone, I'm, I'm afraid. So um, I would start with uh, Nicole Durr, who has a question. Um, hi, my name is Nisni Kolder from the University of Copenhagen. Uh, thank you so much for this amazing keynote and, and for this piece of research. Um, my work is on democracy and social movements, also in America. And um, I had to leave with my fam family. I had to leave to Denmark uh, right before Trump was elected into office. And in our town in Massachusetts, Northampton, all our friends were not only depressed, but they also assembled on the very next day. And the mountain was weird, smeared with swastika in a very liberal area. It's the Happy Valley. Um, so I wonder um, one thing about this lateral fight that you're describing. The guide is so important, the indivisibles guide as you find. It, um, but in that guide, um, one thing that's particularly interesting is that there is a, a section on you should speak out to diverse populations. You should consider their social class, language, and identity. And you are describing how the national level, younger, is much more identity politics oriented than the local people who did the work. 
and you say that there, I would want to know more about these, how did they deal with their differences within the movement on the left? A, that's my first question. And then B, so, so I find it really interesting that um, like you showed for, for those who used pro-life signs in order to gain more voters, that, that's a cultural translation of a left to reach out to more religiously oriented um, rural populations. So was, did you see more of that kind? And could that be a strategy to prevent more um, ethno-nationalism and beat the Trumpists and beat the, um, um, the Tea Party movement? Or do you think this is lost? And could it be that the Tea Party, like what, they actually, what Trump mobilized is really not that he's sharing, that he's distributing, but he's kind of mobilizing on, if I don't get it, if I get poorer, the others all on punitive politics, like punishing the others. We take it away from immigrants, we take it away from blacks, and that's how we feel better, even if we don't get more as the, the do you think one can, the left can win that fight or not? That's my question, and thank you. Okay, <laughs> that's a lot. You know, I, I um, will say that in my interviews with grassroots people on the right, um, they take great emotional satisfaction in the part of Trump that is saying outrageous things to liberals. Um, one of the things that this research has convinced me is that a lot of politics is about who we are and who they are. And that when you feel threatened, uh, you enjoy having someone um, take it to, take the conflict to others. I think that's true on both sides, but it's especially true on the right, in my experience. And I don't believe a lot of uh, Tea Party activists, at least, who became passionate Trump supporters, ever believed that he would build the wall on the southern border. What they liked was that he was trying. And they, they took that as a symbol of his effort to exclude uh, immigrants and limit their political power. The same is true for Blacks, I think. It's not so much about excluding blacks as it is limiting their political power. Um, so um, your question about tensions within the left. Well, tension is the right word um, because um, on both sides, because the common enemy is so threatening. Um, the, the, the top down and bottom up and people with different policy priorities are like to, like to, likely to work together. Uh, but you can see these tensions, uh, for example, if the national indivisible leaders send out a call for everybody to call their Congress people and say, don't vote for the budget if it doesn't succeed in reforming immigration. Well, a lot of these older women, they don't argue about it. They just don't do it. <laughs> I mean, they handle it a lot of the way a mother would handle a teenager. I mean, I, I, I just feel that there's very, now I'm an older woman, so maybe I see it that way, but it's just a sort of patient, yeah, 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 sure, and, and proceeding with things that they're prepared to do. It's not that there's an overt argument. Um, there, the overt argument that has appeared on the left is over whether in relatively moderate or conservative areas of the country, there should be an effort to primary Democrats in office. Um, the national leaders of Indivisible have joined other national advocacy groups on the left in trying to promote such challenges and overwhelmingly local resistance groups have opposed that, have simply not agreed because they don't think those people can win in their areas. And that's what was going on with the appeal about the pro-life signs, simply trying to blunt some of the anger and un unwilling to hear a message about health reform coming from neighbors that they knew were overwhelmingly pro-life. Now, do I think personally that very many of the hardcore Tea Parties and Trumpist people are going to be persuaded by any of this? Absolutely not. I don't think they can be persuaded at all. They have to be defeated. But there are people in the middle who, who uh, uh, don't pay much attention, amazingly enough, or who um, are conflicted for example, on issues like abortion or immigration, who 
can be persuaded by um, inclusive arguments. Thanks a lot. We would uh, alternate online and offline questions. So I would just read out a question from the Q&A um, from Konstantin Fossing. He says, in a nutshell, how is this organizing you describe different from the ide ideal typical pluralism, say, in the 1950s, or compared to the political machines of the second half of the 19th century? Well, I mean, the 1950s uh, pluralist arguments were referring to ongoing uh, interest groups that most of which were professionally uh, staffed. Uh, most of these local groups are literally volunteer creations that depend on um, the enthusiasm and the devotion of a modest number of leaders and maybe 50 to 100 participants. Um, they resemble somewhat more the ongoing local chapters of huge voluntary federations that I've done research on in the past, but they aren't as formally organized. Um, or necessarily as permanent. Um, it's very different from machine politics. Machine politics was a politics based on uh, doing favors and it was organized through the political parties. Um, this is outside the two political parties, overlapping with them in many cases, sometimes trying to take over their local parts, but it is, uh, much more like movement organizing uh, in a consistent way. I actually think, you know, and I've, I've done research on American voluntary groups and movements throughout American history. I think there's something new about, about these uh, upsurges uh, in the Tea Party and the, and the resistance. And of course they use um, electronic internet-based communications. In the case of the Tea Party, Meetup was a modality they used, and then they used Facebook, and the resistors used Facebook, unlike the young people who've moved beyond Facebook. So, you know, I, I would say um, the ease of combining person-to-person, face-to-face meetings with and contacting with internet communications probably has been a factor in, in enabling the wildfire spread of um, somewhat similar voluntary grassroots organizations, but I don't see them as exactly like either of those predecessors. Thanks a lot, surely also in Konstantin's name. Um, the next question is from the, from the audience here on site again, Clara. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing your fascinating work on grassroots uh, groups in the United States. Um, I was actually, um, so, yeah, not surprised, maybe a little bit surprised that there are so many districts where in North, I think you showed a map from um, Pennsylvania and uh, North Carolina where there are so many districts with both resistance and like Tea Party groups. And I was wondering how they interact, if they interact, um, and if you, yeah, have anything interesting to say about that? Thanks. Well, sometimes they know about each other. Sometimes they don't. Obviously, I don't have totally systematic data on that. Uh, American uh, quantitative researchers tend to survey individuals. They do not survey them about groups, and they do not survey group leaders. Our 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 work does that. And in my field visits, I always I try to interview both sides. Um, I follow research rules, so I don't tell one set of people that I'm talking to the other um, unless I have their permission. But I do ask on field visits whether people know about um, or know of. And, you know, my experience is that they may know of the other side organizing. If the Tea Party still exists, when the resistance groups came into, they may in fact, go down and do a counter demonstration in the town square if, if they know something has happened. And I, one of my Tea Party contacts told me very proudly that he had done that, gone after the Soros groups, as he put it, and uh, sent uh, pictures of himself, uh, which I also saw in the local newspaper. We follow the local newspapers where they exist. 
Um, but I would say that dimly aware is the most you're going to get. You do not get usually cooperation, direct cooperation of any kind, uh, even debate. Um, these are self-activated groups of people in the orbit of the two political parties that are alarmed enough about what they see happening nationally to get off their keisters and organize and, and keep at it and try to have a vocal presence in their communities and states. But they don't necessarily want to engage one another Thanks a lot. Um, I, we have more questions in the Q&A and I um, would combine one question that was asked by Hans-Peter Krisi and Lynette Ong. Um, they both ask why the anti-Trump movement didn't have such a strong effect on the Democratic Party, why the Tea Party had this effect on, on the GOP. And maybe as the second question that Hans-Peter asked, um, he says, I'm surprised that the activists in the resistance movement were equally old as in the Tea Party. Why are the younger people, what are, what are the younger people on the left doing? Well, uh, you know, I would say that um, these widespread voluntarily, voluntary group-based uh, organizational formations in the Tea Party and the resistance um, are the creations of older people and retirees who, who, who have or make time for that kind of organizing. And when you get outside the big cities, on the center left, the people that you're going to find are librarians, teachers, adjunct professors at regional state universities, um, Healthcare people who were pretty alarmed at the idea that the Affordable Care Act could be um, repealed. The Tea Party, um, I would say the leaders and the supporters mirror demographically the types of people who vote for Republicans or for folks to the right of the Republicans. Um, on the left, there are many organizations in cities in particular that are run by and peopled by young people. But, you know, there's very interesting research on the big marches that occurred during the um, first year of the Trump presidency and older women were the core of them too. Um, older women were behind the scenes in the in the, uh, in the gun movement that erupted after the Florida uh, shootings in which young people were on the stages and on the TV. Uh, in some of the smaller counties I visited, I learned that high schoolers mounted demonstrations uh, about gun safety after the Florida shooting, but it was usually the resistance groups with the women who helped them do it behind the scenes and simply stayed behind the scenes. Uh, not until Black Lives Matter were the big demonstrations actually dominated by young people. And they were dominated by young people in part because those were the only people willing to go out during a pandemic, frankly. I think there would have been more older people in many of those demonstrations than there were, and there were still a lot, they weren't more fearful of the virus during the summer of 2020. Um, so young people are definitely involved, but more sporadically, more given to street protests, more given to tweeting, more, um, more likely to be the staff members of the professionally run left advocacy groups with headquarters in the big cities and in Washington, DC. Um, their style of politics is a little different. And their presence is much more concentrated in college towns and big cities. As for the impact on the parties, here's how to think about it. Tea parties 
not only were spread across the country, they were denser on the ground in very conservative Republican districts and states. They were everywhere, both movements were everywhere, but the partisan tilt of the Tea Parties, if you, if in terms of the per capita number of Tea Parties per population, which is what we can measure, was greater on the very right in very conservative states like Texas, in um, conservative districts within every state. Whereas resistance groups were more kind of everywhere. And um, that means that um, the Republican Party, which already has a very conservative tilt toward it, just in terms of where it, it, its voters are located, got more of an edge toward the hard right and particularly the ethno-nationalist right when Tea Partiers organized. The uh, impact on Democrats has been to kind of create more vitality and, and presence and voice where it didn't exist as much before and to set up these kind of ongoing um, cooperation, tension-filled tension cooperation is what I would call it, between the younger and older generations of activists. On the, Republic, on the Democratic side. Um, I don't wanna say that there hasn't been a huge impact on the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is becoming more of a party of college educated people, particularly women. And they have been added into a coalition, very concentrated among younger voters who don't always turn out and African-Americans and to a lesser degree, Hispanics. It takes all of that to have any chance at all to win elections nationally and statewide, given that the US system is profoundly biased in terms of translating votes into electoral representation against the current Democratic Party constituencies. So with fewer people organizing, in a voting population that's more concentrated in conservative areas, a huge pull on the Republican Party can be and has been created toward the ethno-nationalist right. The impact on the Democrats has been to give them a fighting chance to put together the incredible cacophony of voices that they somehow have to herd together to accomplish anything. Thank you. Um, given how advanced we are ready with the time, I would combine one of the online questions that I will read out and then give the floor to Sebastian. So an anonymous person from the audience asked that you mentioned how the Pantheon Nation organized online. Could you maybe share your observations on the usage of social media and online platforms between the Tea Party and resistance groups and what does this usage mean for either group in advancing their goals? And then I would ask Sebastian and then the floor is yours again, Professor Scott. Hi, my name is Sebastian Hellmeyer. I'm a postdoc at the Berlin Social Science Center. And uh, thanks first of all for the inspiring talk and uh, all the evidence that you presented. I was particularly struck by the finding on the motivation of people uh, for joining the anti-Trump anti-Trump resistance groups. And from what you showed, it appeared to me that it's a highly personalized movement that focuses on the person of Trump. And I mean, your outlook on the political developments in the US were rather pessimistic, but let's think about maybe a post-Trump world. Uh, what will happen to these groups once Trump is gone? Um, will they regroup behind another political cause? Will they fall apart because their main target is achieved? or what is the, the future for the anti-Trump resistance after Trump? Thanks. Okay, well, quickly, I think uh, um, internet facilitated media have been important for both um, movements, but in combination with person-to-person -person contacting and face-to-face and -face meetings. And I'm, um, I'm, you can put me in the skeptical camp when it comes to the idea that um, new modes of communication themselves 
in and of themselves revolutionize uh, citizen participation in organizing. I think they magnify, speed up uh, things, but they have to be understood in combination. Now, that's not to say that I don't think there's something to this idea that um, extremist appeals to emotion have been have been uh, privileged. I'm pretty sure those emotions would have been there anyway, but they were organized and channeled by both of these grassroots movements in all of their components, online and offline. Um, you know, I thought that it was all about Trump and would end when he lost re-election, but I've changed my mind about that. One of two major political parties in the United States, and there are many forces that privilege two parties, has been turned into uh, a quasi-authoritarian movement. Um, that is not so much because of these grassroots people. It's because elites have decided to try to ride the tiger, use the tiger, and in some cases have joined it. That includes people with wealth, privileged Ivy League educations. It is a um, form of collaboration with divisive, hateful organizing that we have seen before and we're seeing it again. And uh, I think that as long as one of two major political parties, which many, many of its supporters will vote for it because it's not the other party. You know, in my field interviews, I interviewed a lot of Republicans and a lot of, of various stripes. And a certain proportion of them would always end the interview by saying, I wish Donald Trump would stop tweeting as much. Those were the ones that found him distasteful. And when a longtime standard Republican in Ohio said that to me on the second interview, I finally looked up at her and said, I don't think that's going to happen. And she smiled back and said, you're probably right. She didn't say, I'm going to stop voting for it. When I interviewed a wealthy multimillionaire, who, like the Koch network itself, didn't endorse Donald Trump, but came around to support him and his followers in Congress. He said to me, I find his ethnic appeals hateful. They make me uncomfortable. They're gross. They're awful. But it's what his supporters want. And I thank God every day he's there to pass the tax cuts on the business regulations I, and to oppose business regulations. That's what's going on, and it's now institutionalized. It will survive Donald Trump himself if he were to drop dead tomorrow. And in any event, Donald Trump isn't going anywhere. And in some ways, that's the best hope Democrats have, because many of the resistance people are here to stay in politics, but they will, Donald Trump activates both sides in elections. He probably recruits as many voters against him as he does for him. So the more he's front and center, uh, in some ways, the better. But it goes well beyond him, what's happening in American politics on the right now. Thank you. We have three final questions that I would also combine. So I just want to read out the two questions that are actually three in the Q&A and then as like the final question ask Andrew Borba to uh, ask his question who is here in the audience. So um, the first question asks about the lack of communication between these two groups as well as their readiness to identify with their respective collective. So what does this mean for the fate of democracy? Can we even talk about democracy in the absence um, of any openness towards counter arguments? That's question one. And then uh, question two is a two-part question. 
So um, substantively, and it's from Jennifer also, um, I wonder, or she wonders, <laughs> what um, these new dynamics, how they, that you describe, how can they be generalized to context outside of uh, the United States of America? And the second part of the question is, is methodological, because um, your team's work on this project is wonderful, she says, and uh, especially the localized field work. But um, she also points out that you have used so many methodological approaches in your career, and uh, she asks for your insight uh, on why you choose this methodological approach and how research interested in cross-national work can learn from, from your recent work methodologically. And then the, the final, final question is uh, Andre Warbat, who is here in the room. Hi, thanks. Thanks, also for having uh, the, the opportunity to ask something at the end of your talk. Um, and thanks very much for presenting your work. My name is uh, Endra Borbat. I'm a postdoc at the Freie Universität Berlin and here at the Center for Civil Society Research. And I wanted to ask you about the extent to which these movements, the resistance and the Tea Party, are driven by uh, past shocks um, and inertia, as opposed to current kind of events. So to what extent to, how much energy is this in this tiger that you described? Do they still have new members coming in? Do they still appear kind of, or is this somehow an inertia that is driven by shocks that happened in the past when there were the big debates on healthcare, when Trump was elected, etc.? Thank you. Well, just to speak to the last one, I mean, you know, the U.S. election in 2020 had the highest turnout in 100 years. U.S. democracy has low voter turnout but um, it's gone up. I think we can say that with these movements, just the tiny cutting edge, obviously those who become active organizers and participants are, are part of a much broader concentric circles. Um, we're seeing um, masses of Americans who are aware that there are high stakes and are at, at the very least voting. Uh, and paying attention. So I don't think it's over at all. I, I actually think it's uh, received a new round of energy. Um, I am not a methodological, um, I don't go from one methodology to another. I'm a methodological pluralist. And all that's happened in my career since this, the work on the Tea Party, which I did with Vanessa Williamson, starting in 2010 and 11, is that I've added um, a new uh, way of trying to understand things on top of the methods that I always use. Um, I, I'm most serious about the proposition that the way to study politics is to look at organizations and networks, not just uh, aggregates of individuals, whether they be in Congress and they're in the electorate like a bunch of potatoes in a sack. Um, I think organization and networks and how they interact with institutional configurations are the key to the way political dynamics play out. And I've always thought that. I mean, you can find those arguments in states and social revolutions and in bringing the state back in and in the early work that uh, I did historically on American civic uh, voluntary organizations. Uh, what was new in the Tea Party era is that because we were looking at something that emerged, that obviously was kickstarted by Barack Obama's election to the presidency, even if it drew on strands that were there already, um, it helped to talk to people and it helped to it helped to actually observe things. And but. Obviously, uh, if you go back and look at the Tea Party book that Vanessa and I did, we put that together with uh, systematic uh, plumbing of the survey research that was available and looking at uh, or configurations of organizations. And we're doing even more of that, uh, my colleagues and I now, in trying to develop, we've got the closest thing anybody's ever going to have to databases of, of about 2,000 locally present named Tea Parties and about 3,000 locally present named resistance groups. Even their names are fun to learn. So, I mean, um, my research gets into the most intimate of details 
and tries to keep the big picture in mind. And it's not an easy thing to do. It's a pulling back and forth between plunging in and pulling back. And you could see it in the talk that I gave today, the attempt to do that. It's not perfect and it's an ongoing project. And the, the interviewing of people is not for the sake of simply understanding how they think about things. I'm just gonna end with a little bit of a diatribe. I think way too much of politics today and way too much of research is about how people feel. I'm interested in how people feel, but I'm especially interested in these interviews and learning what they did. And so one of the things that we did in the Tea Party interviews was to get a sense of how people felt. That's where the sense of fear and anger comes together. But also ask specific questions. How did you learn about the Tea Party? How did you get together with other people who did it? Those are structural questions. Those are absolutely structural questions. And they relate to ongoing debates about how social movements form and uh, how they have their impact. So um, I just think it's an added dimension. I couldn't go back and interview the people I studied in the past but I can now. And I find the grassroots interviews more interesting than elite interviews. You, you almost don't have to interview elites. They're always out there proclaiming things. So in a recent study we did of North Carolina and Georgia, we read everything Stacey Abrams wrote and everything Reverend Barber wrote. We looked at all their interviews online, but we didn't have to interview them face to face because it's all there. They, they say it all. Um, grassroots people are different. If you want to know why they're participating, it's a good idea to observe their participation and listen to why they say so. So it's just one piece of the picture, but it's fascinating. Um, and you learn things you could never learn, even from the best surveys. We, for example, in the Tea Party case, learned that Tea Party people were angry about their grandchildren and their grandnephews angry that they were taking Pell Grants to go to college, angry that they liked Obama. That wasn't racial. It gets you beyond the stereotypes and into the nitty gritty of what is really going on in a very fast changing country. As for the international component, I'll just say, I do think these ethno-nationalist movements are happening everywhere. I think they play out very differently depending on what the whether it's a multi-party system or a two-party system. And I think they play out differently in, in, in terms of, of the nature of emig immigration and refugee waves that help to spark them. They also play out very differently against the backdrop of different kinds of welfare states that are already in place. And in the US, the fact that the fights are about Obamacare is because the US didn't have universal health insurance. And old people who already have health insurance in the United States tend to see extending health insurance coverage to younger, uh, less white people as a threat to their existing entitlements. We learned that in our interviews and we think that's one of the big motivators in the policy reverberations of this politics, along of course with the obvious fights over immigration policy, which are front and center. So, I think these same tendencies are happening in an interconnected world where people are on the move, but it makes a very big difference what the previous institutions are, what the political system is, and the nature of the welfare state that's in place as they play out. Thanks so much. Um, and thank you for providing us this very deep insights in this additional piece of the picture. Um, I think we all enjoyed your talk very much. And I just speak for all of us to say thank you that you took the time. Um, and yes, uh, I wish you a good day. <laughs> thank you for your questions, all excellent. And I hope your, your conference continues to go well. Thanks a lot. <laughs>